Welcome students to EPG Pathshala. Today we are going to be talking about Taxonomy of Social Theories, Overview of Practice Perspectives in Social Work, Part 5. I am Dr. Ruchi Sinha from the Center for Criminology and Justice, School of Social Work, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Within this module, students, we are going to walk through knowledge building on the practice perspectives linked to radical humanism. So here you will develop an understanding of social work practice from the radical humanist paradigm. It will help you contextualize professional social work ideology uh, and this would uh, enable you to understand the diversity from the raises of consciousness paradigm in social work practice. The two uh, paradigms of practice that we would be uh, talking about here is criminal justice social work and feminist social work. So as I said, this module is explaining the raises of consciousness quadrant of the taxonomy provided by David Howey, which is the radical humanist quadrant of Burel and Morgan model. As a recap, you would recall the two important dimensions, subjective approach versus objective approach and regulation versus radical change. Now, if you look at figure one, the radical humanist paradigm is ensconced by the dimensions of subjective and radical. It aligns to nominalism as it assumes that social reality is relative and the social world is mainly names, concepts and labels. These labels are artificial creations. The paradigm is anti-positivist as it says that observing, merely observing behavior, merely understanding behavior cannot help us understand what is happening to a particular individual. It grounds itself in the premise that one has to experience that reality and behavior directly and hence they reject that social science can create a true objective knowledge of any kind. They are voluntarists as they believe in the free will and they give no importance to the subjective notions. And the most important premise is that they focus, uh, the most important method here is that they focus on getting inside the subject's experience and exploring a detailed uh, understanding of one's own life and background. This stream of thought or practice aligns itself to Marxist humanism and the theorists in this space have described the phenomenon of uh, alienation as the main reason of oppression and domination of uh, in society and obviously some of the notable thinkers here are and uh, as a practice whatever thinkers are mentioned below Please go through their detailed understanding of society and oppression, which will help you understand this paradigm of practice. One thinker within this paradigm is Georgi Lukas, from 1885 to 1971 is his lifespan. He was a Hungarian Marxist philosopher and a literary critic. He developed the theory of reification, whereby he said, due to the commodity nature of capitalist society, social relations have become objectified. This preludes the spontaneous emergence of class consciousness. Most of the thinkers in this paradigm have aligned themselves to the capitalist notions and discussing the impact of capitalism on individual lives. So similarly, Ant Antonio Gramsci from 1891 to 1937, who was an Italian writer, politician, political philosopher and linguist, gave the notion of ideological hegemony or hegemony. His notions of cultural hegemony was very, very important because he was able to elucidate that how a person is oppressed through different mechanisms and he was able to show how culture is oppressing as well. So something that people took as a way of life was actually not a way of life but was actually a way of oppression by the bourgeois over the proletariats. So the use of cultural institutions to maintain power in capitalist societies was the biggest uh, contribution of Antonio Gramsci which has a whole lot of contribution to this practice paradigm. Another notable thinker here who has uh, help practitioners in social work understand the concept of space is Henry Leferbe, 1901 to 1991. He was a French sociologist, intellectual and philosopher. 
his critique of everyday life actually brought forth the capitalist intrusion in everyday life. He argued that capitalism changed everyday life and he saw it as a space that was colonized through sheer consumption. So my needs were made into a consumptive pattern. So if I'm hungry, my hunger was linked to only money and what money can buy. It was not linked to what I want and what I need. He believed that in the zone of everydayness, which is actually boredom, as you will, uh, when you read him more extensively, you will see, existed across the class. And it is this boredom, it is this everydayness, where the beginning of people's understanding and then revolutionizing their everyday lives will begin. And hence, he said that capitalism is attempting to actually push everydayness, push this questioning, push this boredom to the margins so that people don't start questioning, is this what I want? Is this what I need? You are actually a robotic life, you are actually leading a robotic lifestyle here where you are not deciding what you need. I don't decide what I need to be uh, getting if I need to be educated. Who decides that I need English as my language? Who decides that I need science as a stream of education? It's not decided by me, it's decided by the outside world. And this is what Le Ferbe has very easily, very conveniently and very nicely brought in the forefront. Paulo Freire, another thinker who has actually, and in fact he is one thinker that most students quite align to because he talks about the education system. And he has talked about how education system actually plays a very important role in oppression. When he proposed this, it was uh, pretty much a new concept because education was seen as a tool to liberate people. And he was propounding exactly the opposite where he was saying that the present education system was actually oppressing people. So it is very important for you to remember that he was not saying that education is oppressive. He's saying that the way education is rolled out, it is oppressive. So here he's saying, uh, and which most of you have experienced because uh, I'm assuming most of you are uh, have gone through your graduation and obviously schooling, where I am sure your teachers did not ask you to think. I'm sure your teachers never asked you to understand what is it that is being taught. Did either one of you ever have the opportunity to say, I don't agree the way in which history is being taught to me. I don't want to understand how the king thought the society was arranged. I want to understand that how probably the farmer and the potter in that point of time, in that period of time, was living his life. Did you ever have that opportunity? If you did have that opportunity, you are lucky. But if you didn't have an opportunity, you are actually victims of the capitalist mode of education where you're not allowed to think, question and critique, but you're actually forced to ingest, take in whatever is being taught to you. So Paulo Freire basically believed that education can help the oppressed to regain their sense of humanity and in turn overcome their condition. But he acknowledged that for this to occur, the oppressed individual must play a role in their liberation. And he believed that no pedagogy is truly liberating, uh, no pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunate and by presenting for them their emulation models from among the oppressors, oppressed. Uh, oppressors, sorry. And uh, so in simple terms, it basically means that the People who are oppressed have to come up with their own models and the oppressors will not come up with models for the oppressed. So essentially he is saying that I have to think, I have to suggest and I have to be empowered with the knowledge that I think is uh, suitable for me. 
The other thinkers who are uh, prominent in this uh, paradigm are Herbert Marcus, Eric Fromm, Habermas, Sartre, Fanon and Che Guevara. All these thinkers and uh, philosophers have helped us understand that how everyday processes, everyday life have been oppressive and when people start practicing or following everyday life without questioning, we are actually playing into the hands of the power holders and that is what they want the mass, the common man to avoid. So each theorist in this uh, frame describes people as being alienated from and oppressed within the social reality. Each of them explains in details the control of capitalism beyond the material domination. They describe the reach of dehumanized economic production in all spheres of human interaction such as school, family, marriage, play, leisure, space etc. So I'm sure you are privy to a whole lot of discussions that keep happening in various platforms where they say that play has become a capitalist notion today. So um, the youngsters of today, and I hope you're not one of them, are probably gaming on their tablets, on the phones. Phones and tablets are consumptive behavior. But playing out in the open, say something like kabaddi, khoko, etc. is not consumptive. And this phase of paradigm, this practice of paradigm is basically saying that traditional notions, traditional knowledge essentially may not be uh, backward, but there are certain practices that are important for human well-being and welfare. Thinkers in this paradigm describe how the new normal is based on economics and which is replacing the existing norm consciousness and interaction. They show how the need for order, authority, discipline is a need for the ruling class to legitimize power which in turn aims to nip protest and revolutions. And hence, if you look at the economic reality today, trade unions are now taking a back seat and people in the economic realm are becoming dehumanized individuals who are just aiming towards doing a task. Why are they doing that task beyond earning a salary is something that no one is thinking about. So thinkers here elucidate the capitalist attempts to control science, technology, education, welfare, language, culture, social activity, family, life, art, music and literature. Have I left out anything? If I have, well we should be thankful and if I haven't, you should be slightly worried as to how capitalism is controlling our lives. Any attempts to question capitalism does needs to be modified and controlled according to the power holders. Any process to mend the deviant, restore the different Homogenize the colored are the capitalist way to ensure that rule of capital and market is there to stay. So David Howe describes the practitioners in this paradigm as being sensitive and aware of the inequalities prevailing in the society. This paradigm requires a radical critique of the society. So if you look at figure 2, you will understand why does he say that this paradigm requires a critique of society. In this paradigm, uh, it is seen that practitioners believe that all problems that are faced by the people, namely personal, psychological, social or emotional, can be attributed to the dehumanizing processes of modern society. This practice is here. Uh, this practice here is not limited to alleviating personal distress, but is aimed towards addressing the inequities in the society. In fact, it is the starting point for radical practice. So here, practice is attempting to make people aware how social experience in a capitalist society is limiting their thinking, 
how it's shaping their outlook and controls their desires. This requires that people are continuously informed, apprised about the influence of the capitalist society over their lives, beliefs, values, needs and wants. It is here that personal is becoming political and they are seen as being inextricable or they cannot be moved away from each other. For practice here, the personal is the starting point and the political is the end, which means the aims of practice is to change the social order. In fact, interestingly, this paradigm resonates with Ivan Illiches, who, as far as 1977, talked about disabling professions. He said any profession which has control and monopoly over knowledge systems are actually disabling professions. And, uh, whether you like it or not, besides doctors, lawyers, teachers, he also included social workers within that paradigm. And why he included social workers there was because in that time, the expert premise of social work was dominant. Today's premises of social workers as being one amongst the many, being with the client or giving importance to the client perspective or the other radical forms of practice were not so strong at that point of time. So while there are certain forms which could be included, there are certain forms of social work practice which a few practitioners believe may not be as disabling. So this practice realm critiques the central feature of development. Uh, which is resource management and which is primarily concerned with generating profits by producing goods and services for sale in the market. Thus a major objective of ownership is to use what one owns and control in a continuous process and ensure further accumulation and concentration of property. Meeting the needs of people is not a direct objective of ownership and production and hence you would often read um, that how suddenly there is a race all over the world to identify the world's richest, the continent's richest, the country's richest and there is no understanding as to how they became the richest and what helped them become the richest and at whose cost they became the richest. The former is primarily the capitalist way of showcasing success and the latter is the social worker's way of understanding that how success is actually at the cost of individual suffering and individuals experiences. Another intrinsic aspect of uh, this uh, economic system is an all-pervasive exploitative attitude reflected in widespread waste of human potential, materials and energy as well as the irreversible damage to the environment. It basically uh, show, uh, explicates that how the system of um, production is not only um, you know damaging the objective reality but it is also damaging the subjective reality and it is also organizing the socialization process in a manner where your workforce is constantly replicated so if there are not enough people who are not as well educated or do not have a pool of skills, talents and resources, the labor force to work in these dominant workspaces, namely industries and factories would not be available. And hence, everything in the outside world, education, work, family life, socialization, everything is ordered to ensure society continues to be exploitative for some and very helpful to a few and that is the powerful. So students if you look around yourself the various socializing agents such as schools and families thus which are responsible for shape, shaping our consciousness and mindsets of individuals all these socializing agents are actually socializing our mindsets to an authoritarian hierarchical structure 
which resemble in many ways the structures and dynamics of workplaces. These thus are fostering competitive dynamics and in ex inculcate values, beliefs and behavioral tendencies appropriate for adjustment to the prevailing reality or workplaces. So for example, in the education system, there was one um, format of education which was known as the Montessori way of learning where a child learns at his or own pace and maybe learns by doing whereas now education system is more by is more dependent on rote learning this is essentially this should help you understand that the education that you most of us have gone through have not helped us to question what we are going through but has helped us say that yes I have to prepare myself to become an engineer a doctor how is it that no education system prepares us to become a laborer or maybe a potter why doesn't that happen and that is the question that this paradigm practice brings forth to us so I'll take the example of school to further explain this uh, if you look at schools, are there only one form of schools that are available? I'm sure you have seen that some children go to private schools and some children go to government schools. Within government schools also, there are different uh, types. You have municipal schools, you have government schools, you have Kindre Vidyales. And in the private school, you have uh, international formats, you have CBSC, you have ICSC, etc., so on and so forth. So you have different school boards, you have different types of schools, you have different ownerships of schools. The skills that are taught in all these schools are different. The services that are provided in all these schools are different. The fees that you pay for access to these schools is all different. But the positioning of these schools is according to the neighborhood that that school is adhering to. So I'm sure you will not see an international curriculum school in a slum area. You will probably see a municipal school or a government school, say, at a distance of anything between two to five kilometers of a slum area. Thus, lack of access to quality education or rather access to quality education will help you understand that how workforce is then reproduced so children who get the opportunity or the benefit of quality education get the benefit of accumulating skills which is corresponding to that social class and hence a child who comes from a disadvantaged background gets gets access to disadvantaged education and thus becomes relevant to the blue-collared work of the capitalist society a child who comes from a say a middle class background will get access to anything between a middle rung school to some of the best schools depending upon the cost that the family is ready to endure and thus will become a subset of a workforce and people from the middle class largely become managers largely become teachers etc and then the upper class no matter what they get the benefit of the best of the educations and they come back as owners of that particular work environment where the others are have been schooled and have been prepared to work so this reflects a powerful and durable dynamic which permeates societies which is stratified by wealth occupation social prestige religion caste and other dynamics which very subtly yet surely force individuals to play unwitting roles in reproducing hierarchically structured workforce out of correspondingly structured social strata so in this paradigm the problem is defined politically which includes all realms of interactions the explanation and assessment of problems analyzes personal troubles politically. Thus, besides understanding how subjugation affects the individual's psychological and social state, it also contextualizes the feelings of despair, feelings and hopelessness politically. Now, since this is how we are defining the problem and this is how we are explaining or we have assessed the situation, our aim 
therefore is to make the individual aware of pervasiveness of the pervasiveness and insidious impact of the political hold of capitalism and how it is making us vulnerable and destitute and hence here you would understand that when you look at a homeless person instead of seeing his present state of affairs you have to probably understand that this person is probably a person whose land was acquired for some development uh, process say to take the to build a road to build a bridge and farming which was fairly sustainable for him which was probably giving him a bit of food as well besides a bit of capital whatever was the uh, remuneration given to him or the cost that was given to him for that piece of land at the prevailing market prices was not enough to sustain him over a period of time so if you have a homeless person who was a potter who is out of job because plastic steel and glass has overtaken the pots that were probably a uh, everyday affair in most of the indian households he is not on the roads because he wants to be on the road he is on the road because of certain growth and development practices and thus we inform individuals we inform the client system that you are politically linked you have been made vulnerable politically and not individually once the person is made aware of the political processes he or she needs to be helped to take control and gain power for themselves in order to achieve the aims of this paradigm it requires the individuals to one take hold of their consciousness and b take control of their situation hence this paradigm is known as raises of consciousness thus one method of raising consciousness of the individual is through active participation and creating mutual aid spaces through maybe cooperatives unions collectives networks to prevent monopoly of power and knowledge the raises of consciousness paradigm as is clear from the above is about radical change opposing modes of domination working towards emancipation and addressing deprivation this would be further elucidated i'm taking the example of feminist social work practice and we will try to understand through this uh, practice mode how thinking within this paradigm has affected the practice so what is feminist social work feminist social work as many people wrongly think is enabling women enabling women is only one of the practice paradigms it is raising the consciousness of people regarding gender understanding how gender has been oppressive and why we have to ensure that there is equality amongst the two genders it is not about creating hierarchy between genders it is about creating equality between genders so there are two components that are central to feminist social work practice these address various issues that women face in their day to day lives and also elucidates the structural inequities that exist in society So feminist social work link the personal problems that women face with the position and status they have in society. So feminist social work practice uh questions or addresses uh things like who is a woman interacting with what are the interaction patterns of a woman with a man a woman with a child and a woman with other women and by giving women the central focus feminist social work has challenged the gender the traditional gender blind theories of social work and it aims to eliminate gender based oppression and to highlight that violence that women face in their everyday life 
and violence faced by women has become the central notion and instead of becoming a private issue it has become a public concern so uh, domestic violence which initially within the cultural norms was treated privately by families has become a public concern today and it is recognized today that domestic violence is violence with warrants state attention and warrants enough support to the woman to be able to break through that violence. So the experiences of women are the starting point within feminist social work. The sole focus of feminist social work is not only women. It is uh, basically talking about the social relations that exist in society and understanding how and why those social relations exist and the change required in those uh, relationships. In recent days, there have been many efforts to incorporate men more fully into the theory and practice of feminist social workers and that is the equality notion within feminist social work. So we are addressing power imbalance between genders and the core principle thus is integration of personal and public spheres of life, respect for diversity, establishment of equality in social relationships, transforming the existing hierarchical social order, self-reflection, awareness of the distinctive needs of different groups of women, etc. It aims to create an egalitarian social order for everyone. So feminist social work, as I'm sure now you'll realize, questions the concept of power for raising the consciousness about the necessity of equality in social relationships. It believes in replacing the quest for power within feminist ideology of self-empowerment and social work, this feminist social work practice thus critically examines traditional power structure and showcases female culture to construct this egalitarian culture. Summarizing this module, I would like to say that radical social work has developed as an effort to deal with the repercussions of the capitalist society. Capitalism is understood as an economic system that is dependent upon exploitation of labor and this has led to the creation of uh, trade unions by workers and social workers which has showcased the importance of collective and the need of this collective to be able to uh, protect the identity of people who have been oppressed by the power holders. Thus a di defining criteria for radical social work or social work within the raises of consciousness paradigm is collective action. It focuses on larger goals to transform the unjust uh, social economic structure of society to impact the individual within this. Now if you follow up this module with a module on criminal justice social work which I would be presenting, you would understand that how radical social work or radical humanism or raises of consciousness has given us a new practice within social work or others redefined a practice in social work which is criminal justice social work. Uh, I hope you have understood this uh, module and I hope you will follow up with the e-text. Uh, there are readings in that e-text which will help you further ground yourself in this practice ideology. Remember if you are well read and if you are um, well aware of the various dimensions of power that are existing in society, this practice of social work will help you reach out to a larger client system. Thank you.